Before we get started, we have some requirements to follow along if you'd like to participate and follow along with this class. So first, uh, you'd need, of course, Excel. Uh, today, I'll be demonstrating using Excel 2016, which is the version that you'll find on the computers here in the library. If you're using an older version of Excel or if you're using the browser-based Office 365, you might notice some slight differences in appearance and functionality. Um, especially for 365, the shortcuts uh, a lot of times are going to be different because of it being set in a browser. So you can either follow along using a split screen setup where you have the Zoom screen on one side and your uh, Excel on the other so that you can follow along. Or if you happen to have two monitors, it's a great way to follow along. Another option is if you'd like, you can later pull up the recording and follow along using that instead. We do have a sample workbook file that we'll be working from, and um, Ellen will be sharing that link in the chat for you so you can get it and open it up if you'd like. And we'll get started. So let me switch over to our Excel screen. Okay, so quickly, what is a pivot table? A pivot table is a powerful and flexible table in Excel that lets you summarize your data, data from a list or from another table, um, or data that you import. So the data that we have that we're working with today is over here. It's basically set up like we are looking at sales associates, so the salesperson here, and their sales of baked goods. So this would be kind of like a hostess or Little Debbie business that's selling their products to different uh, convenience stores, snack shops, that sort of thing, uh, just to put our information into context. Um, so the nice thing about pivot tables, it, is it allows you to organize and rearrange or pivot the data to meet your needs for various points. Are we having issues with the link? Oh, that's unfortunate. Huh. That could be a problem. It worked yesterday. <laughs> um, so we'll have to see if we can figure that one out. Uh, oh, apparently there's an email in uh, a link in the email. So try that one. It should be the exact same link. I'm not sure why it's not working. Um, but if you've got the email, I recommend that. Um, and we can make the, the example larger so you can see it. Um, but it's a lot of data and that's kind of the point. Um, so I can blow it up a tiny bit, I believe. Let's see. Of course, doing so makes it so that our information is a little bunched up. There we go. Um, is that a little easier to see? So the, the whole point of the pivot table is to make your data um, a little easier to deal with, because right here we've got quite a lot of data. Um, to look at it, we can do Control A to highlight everything, and it'll bring us all the way down to the bottom here. We see it goes all the way down to 910 on our cells. And this is a good thing to do with your data to make sure that you've got know where your end is, because once we start working with pivot tables, we'll need to know what our range of uh, numbers is going to be. So we start all the way at the top at 1A and come all the way down to um, H910. So that's always good to know. And you can move around the points of highlighted data by using the control period um, button, and that'll let you go to all of the corners of your data. It's a nice quick way to get from top to bottom. So um, you also always want to make sure that your data has absolutely no blank rows, blank columns, or cells. Um, this can impact how the algorithms that work with the pivot table interpret things, and it can mess it up. 
So if that means you have to go scrolling through it because you haven't looked at your data lately and you need to make sure, you'll have to painstakingly scroll through. And if it's something you've been working with recently and you know it's all up to date and accurate, you don't have to worry about it. Um, so one thing that you can do, and you used to have to actually have to do this before in some of the older versions, but uh, it's something that you can do to make your data a little easier to work with before you go to a pivot table is to turn it into just a regular table. And you can do this by having any cell in the table highlighted and then coming to insert. And here we have our table and we'll eventually get to the pivot table there, but we're going to first turn our stuff into a official table. And so we see the range here, it says A1 through H910, exactly what we saw. And of course our table has headers. And this automatically converts it into a slightly easier to work with format. It's not quite as helpful as um, say a pivot table would be in organizing the data, but it does make it a little easier to see where the different lines are and it automatically inserts some filters that you can work with. So filters are handy. Um, they can help you narrow down what you're wanting to see. Say you're only wanting to look at specific bits of data, but it doesn't do much in relating data pieces to each other, which is where the pivot table comes in. There are some other things that you can do with this, including inserting a slicer, which we'll get into more with the pivot table, um, which is just kind of a different way to filter things, um, but it doesn't get much more advanced than that. If you wanted to do something more with the data, you'd have to get into making your own um, separate table. So for an example, on the right over here, uh, we wanted to see the total number of cases that each person sold of each kind of product. Well, to do that without doing a pivot table, you'd actually have to painstakingly write up formulas that do the sums of each of these things. And it has to do a whole check using the sum, sum if, which is a formula, well, which is a function specifically in Excel that will look for specific information and then add it up for you. Um, so it's not easy to do. And if you wanted to rearrange this and do something else with it, you'd have to rewrite everything. So not the most convenient. Workable, but you know, not the best. So what we're going to do is we're gonna to try to replicate this chart here using a pivot table. So coming back over to our table, we'll do just like we were going to do the table before, but instead we will select pivot table over here and it will select our table or range. So if we hadn't already turned it into a table, it would be doing the range like we had for the table beforehand. Um, but since we've already got it converted into a table, it just grabs that information. Um, if you ever need to check and make sure that the range is correct, you can click on this here and manually highlight it, or you can scroll and look at it. And then we're given some options in our um, dialog box here. We can either put the table into an existing worksheet or we can make it into a new worksheet. Now, the existing worksheet, it, if you're wanting to be able to look at all of your data at once and have everything in one spot, you can definitely do that and it would let you pick a location. Or if you had, say, a page already set aside for it, you could use that location here and you just click on it and you could select where you'd like to put it and it would start at that point. But the problem with that is it creates it very, um, it gives you a lot of stuff in a lot of small space. It makes it very crowded. Usually with pivot tables, if you're using them for PowerPoints or you're using them to um, analyze data on your own time, it's a lot easier to have it on a new work page where it's nice and clean and that's the only thing you're having to look at. So we'll do that. We'll select new worksheet and okay. And what we get is a little placeholder for our pivot table because we haven't put anything into it yet. So it will take up a predetermined amount of space here. And what also pops up with it is our pivot tables field pane. So this is where we have our headers from our table beforehand 
are now what we call fields in pivot tables. Um, if you ever click out of the pivot table, that pane disappears and you can easily get it right back by clicking back in anywhere in your pivot table. Um, it is also docked to one side. You can break it off and move it elsewhere if you want to. So if you were wanting to change how you were working with it, you could drag it over to the other side and dock it there. You could drag it back, whichever you'd like to do. Um, if you're working with dual monitors, just something to note, um, if you have them set up side by side, it won't dock back onto the side uh, very easily if they're side by side. So you kind of have to find the sweet spot for it to get back there. But that's just a small quirk that you have to deal with if you've, owned, if you've got two monitors up. So moving along, any questions so far? Okay. So once we've got our fields pane over here, we've, like I said, we've got our fields that we're going to work with, and then we have our areas in which we can put our fields to change how the pivot table is shaped. So um, this area, we have what fields can be displayed as rows that you'd put down in this quadrant here. We have what fields you'd want to display as columns up here. The value is what numbers are going to be used, uh, what you're going to be totaling or looking at, and then filters will let you break up the information and show just what you want to see out of it. And we'll get into each of these as we work through here. So you can add uh, fields to each of these by either clicking on the check boxes or dragging them. If you do check boxes, it will automatically move any non-numerical information to the rows section. So say we were, since we're trying to create this one here, we want to have our sales person. So let's switch back here. So we can click that and it automatically put it down there. Um, so we're also wanting to add our products, which we have across the top. So let's bounce back here. And if we were to click products, it would put it down into the rows automatically. And that's not what we want. It puts all of the products under each person's name, makes it quite long, not particularly useful. So we can actually click and drag product over to column. And now we've got it laid out kind of similar. And our values. So we have two value options. We have the item cost and the number of cases. And we also have the total cost, but that's not specifically useful for what we're wanting here. So we are looking at the total number of cases. So we'll take the number of cases and drag it down to the value field. And now we have our pivot table. And if we look here we've got 700 or 7,997. And we'll do a comparison. We've got our chocolate cream cakes have 1679. So let's look at our other one here. So chocolate cream cakes, 1679. Good. And our total, 7,997. Awesome. So all of that easily brought up there without having to do any formula writing at all. It does it all in the background. Did we have any questions, anything that needs to be repeated? Yes, uh, we had a participant asking uh, how you got uh, the pivot table onto the next page. So that was part of the creation dialog box. So I'll pop back here and show you. Um, so when we come back here and insert and do pivot table, uh, we selected new worksheet and it automatically pulled up a new worksheet for us and put the pivot table there. Uh, and then you'll just navigate using the uh, little tabs down here at the bottom. Um, if you're having trouble getting it to pop up and make uh, the correct table, you can use the manipulating data uh, tab to move on just so that you can carry on with the rest of what we'll be covering, but it should give you a new sheet right over here next to creating 
tab and give you the uh, filler space pivot table before you get it up and going. Let's see, we have a question about the totals column. Um, it should generate the totals automatically. If not, um, we can come over here to the uh, designs section and there should be grand totals. And if it gets turned off, that can happen sometimes. Um, so if you want the grand total for the columns and the rows, you can do that by on for rows and columns because um, it can, like I said, be turned off and then it would look just like this without any of your totals. So you can turn those back on like that. Hopefully that solves your problem there. And we'll get into the design uh, section in just a little bit. We're actually coming up on that not too long here. Um, I'm gonna look at a few different ways we can arrange the data before we get into design options. So some options that we have here. So currently we have our salespeople and we've got our uh, products. But if say we decided we wanted to look at maybe the total amount that each person brought in with their sales, we can bring the sum of number of cases out because we don't need that anymore. And you can click and drag it out or you can also um, opt to remove the field by clicking on the little drop down arrow and there's an X for remove field. I'm a fan of drag and drop just because uh, it's very tactile, but you can pick whatever works best for you. And then we can put our item cost in there. Now, the downside to pivot tables is it doesn't recognize uh, number values automatically. You have to work with it uh, to get it to do what you want it to do. Because right now it does have the numbers correctly, but it doesn't show them as a monetary value and we can change that by right clicking over here um, and coming down to value field setting and that will give us some options we can come down to number format and that will let us change the number format for all of the values so once we get into the number format for ourselves we'll come over here to currency because that's what we're working with. And there's a few different options here. Um, if you like to have the negative sign, you can go with that. If you're wanting to look more like an accountant's book, um, the uh, parentheses is a standard for accounting. And since we're working with fairly large numbers, we don't need those uh, cents to muddy up the water. So we're gonna get rid of our decimal places down to zero and it'll round the numbers out for us automatically. So we hit okay, and then come back here and hit okay again. And now we've got our nice dollar signs and we can see who earned the most grand total wise, which uh, products brought in the most money. Looks like everybody loves the chocolate cream cakes. And that is one way to adjust your information. All right, we can also switch this back fairly easily. If we do decide that we wanna switch it back, something that you'll have to keep in mind is that formatting that we just did is gonna get completely undone. So we'd have to format every time we bring the cost back in there. So it's a small hassle, but something that does at least make it look a little better. So we can bring our items back and if you were to do the cost again, it reduces it back to not having the dollar signs in front of it. So I'll bring our cases back. So another thing we can do is we can add customers to our column so we can see who bought what. So if we do that, we end up with some very long information here. Um, it spreads it out a lot, but maybe that's what you're needing. You're needing to see who, which of the customers bought the chocolate cream cakes, which of the cookie crisps got bought by different customers, and you can see what numbers fall where. Now you can also rearrange these. Uh, so it'll always go first 
field at the top, and then the second one will be your secondary. And you can swap them. And sometimes that's also what you want to do. You want to see, okay, I, I want to see all of the different numbers that, you know, Happy Mart bought, all the different numbers of cases, and find out where, let's say, our customer is really interested in buying stuff or who's good at selling what particular product to that customer. Um, if you wanted to narrow it down, there's a little small, tiny, itty bitty uh, negative box here that you can click on and then you can expand using the positive number or if you don't want to try to get to that teeny tiny spot, you can double click on it and it'll uh, do the same thing. It'll shrink and expand. So. That's really handy because that's a very teeny tiny spot to try to hit with your mouse. And that'll let you shrink everything down and then you can just see that specific information, the grand totals for Happy Mart, Quick Stop, Simple Grocery, Snack Shack, and Snack and More. All right. You can also, of course, do that on uh, the... Um, my brain is failing here. You can also switch it so that uh, you've got rows that are split like that as well. So let's see, let's do, uh, we want to see who the person sold to. So we can see our grand totals of all the sales they did up here and then break it up by the individual customers that they sold to. And you can see what they've done with their numbers there. Again, you can also swap them and get different information that way and see who all works with each business. So you can find out who is big at working with what business and also look at their numbers and find out who does the best sales at that business. So that's just a few different ways you can play with the data and move it around to meet your needs. So since we've got it set up like this, let's switch it around just so we can look at this here. So in our design options, we have a few different things you can do with um, to work with this here. Um, so, there's different report layouts that work in different ways. So the compact form is going to give you the most uh, information um, in least spread out horizontally. It bunches it up a bit more. If you wanna see it in a different type of format, there's also outline form, which spreads it out a little bit more and it also uh, separates your grand totals, or not grand totals, but your subtotals here at the top uh, from the individual items that you see. And then our final difference, and it looks fairly similar when you look at it, is the tabular form and the that one looks fairly similar, but it, uh, and if we were to have the subtotals in the same spot up at the top here, it puts the subtotals down at the bottom and gives you some lines to break it up a little bit. So it's really what works best for what you're working with. The compact one is real nice if you're trying to save space, um, but it also does look a little more crowded. You can change that up though. There are options to make it a little more easy to look at. You can add banded rows if what you're wanting to focus on is in the rows or you can add banded columns if you're wanting to really differentiate your columns that you're looking at. All right, any questions? I think I might have uh, fixed the link, so I'm going to give it a try. Um, so I appreciate everybody's uh, patience uh, for the sample workbook. So please uh, try that link and see if that will work. I hope so. 
If not, we uh, with the the recording, we can send the link out again um, and make sure that it works so that it, you can follow along with the recording if uh, this does not work. <laughs> You've got to love technical difficulties. Um, so aside from making it look pretty and uh, change it up that way, picking different colors that you like to work with, there are some other things we can do. Um, we also need to be able to refresh our data because with pivot tables, it does not automatically update when the base data that you're working with uh, gets changed. So let me see if I can get back to my original. There we go. So let's say we'll, we'll hop over to our manipulating data just so that it's, we've got something clean and non tinkered with to work with here. Um, so let's say we realized that Terry over here, we misspelled their name. It's Terry with a Y and not Terry with an I. So we need to fix that. Well, we have to do that in our base data that we're working with, our data set. And you can easily do a change like that where the information has been repeated over and over again by using the find function. So you can do control F and that'll get you the replace and find, find and replace tab here that pops up the little dialog box for that. Again, that was control F. And you wanna make sure to press and hold the control button while you're hitting the F button. And then we can type in what we're looking for. So we're wanting to replace Terry with an I with Terry with a Y. And we know that we wanna replace them all. There's no question on that. So we can just hit the replace all button and we've made 79 replacements all taken care of. But in our data here, as we can see, it's still Terry with an I. So we have to come up to the pivot table tool ribbon up here and the analyze ribbon specifically. And there's a refresh button here. Uh, you wanna click the part that actually has the picture because that'll automatically refresh everything. You can, if you were trying to get specific, refresh just a specific section, but we wanna refresh all of the data. So we'll hit that button. And one thing that it does is if you ever change anything that affects the either the rows labels or the columns labels, it puts that new data at the bottom. If you changed something that didn't affect that, the numbers would just change. Uh, but because we changed something on, over here, it brought it down to the bottom. Um, I'm honestly not sure why it does that. Um, guessing maybe so it's easy to see the changes you've made. That's my best guess. I have not actually seen why it does that, but it does do that for both rows and columns. So if you wanted to get this back in the proper alphabetical order, you'd have to come up here to the filters button and do sort A to Z, and it'll put it back in the right order. And our Terry with a Y is back where he needs to be. So, any questions about updating the data? Oh, the replace, yeah, I can show that again, that's easy. Um, so hop back over here to our main data. So um, you can also use, there's a tool button for it up here to find, and I believe it's find and select, yeah you can come down to replace. So if you don't remember the shortcut, it's up here at the top and you just click that. Um, I'm a fan of shortcuts because it limits how much movement I have to do with my mouse. So that's control F and it brings up the find and replace and you just click the replace over here. And you have the option to find everything and see where it's all at or you can replace everything all at once without having to look at every individual one. You can replace them one at a time if you're not sure that you need to replace all of the Terry's. Say you have two Terry's <laughs> and one of them needs to be Terry with an I and one of them needs to be Terry with a Y. You could do that um, to kind of make sure you don't accidentally replace things you don't need to. And I think I see a question about adjusting column width. Um, I can go over that real quick, sure. Um, there's two ways you can do it. Well, technically three if you wanna get really fancy. So the first way is to just do it manually and you come up here to the line in between the two columns that you're wanting to adjust and it will always move uh, 
the one to the left. So it'll resize to the, the one to the left. So you'll make it either wider or smaller. Or if you want, you can also select the column and come over here to format and drop down and do column width. And this is where it's technically two options. You can either select to auto fit, which will fit to the largest text in your columns and it'll automatically space that out. Or you can manually select how big you want it to be. Say you wanted to have a little cushion around your words. You could go, okay, well, that's not quite what I want. Let's round it up to 22 and bam, you've got a little extra cushion there. And you can do the same thing with your row height and adjust it either up here or to the side. So we do have uh, one more is how did you uh, decur between the Terry's? Well, for me, there's only one Terry in here, so I didn't have to worry about that and I could just auto replace. If you happened to have, like I said, two Terry's, um, the easiest way to do it so that you wouldn't have to uh, do a slow replace each individual one uh, would be to actually type in the last name plus the first name. So it would specifically look for, say, I'm wanting to fix Malloy Terry um, and then switch it to Malloy Terry with a Y. Right now I don't have any Terry's with an I, but if, if I was doing that and I had two Terry's, this would make sure I only changed the Terry Malloy instead of like Terry Beck. Um, you can also do the find all option and then slowly replace the ones that are there instead. And that's, that's a lot slower. It's a lot easier to hit the replace all and then you've got them all replaced. Fortunately, we've only got one Terry, so we don't have to worry about that. And then we have one more question. Uh, instead of sure. the total sum, can you do something like an average per month, uh, either on total costs or the number of cases? So I can get into changing up the values at a later point. I've actually got that further down as we go. Um, at, once we get past talking about grouping, um, if you want, we could jump ahead to that and then go to grouping. Um, since there's an interest in that. So we'll hop over here to the values tab and we've got, um, I'm not gonna show uh, exactly specifically how to break it up by months just because that's a lot of steps, but I'm gonna give you an idea of how to play with the, the values because there's a lot of different ways to play with the values. Um, so we've got Right now, our number of cases, which is, you know, not a bad amount of information to have. I mean, we can clearly see who sold the most, but maybe we want to see the total percentage of the cases that each person sold. So what we can do is we can actually take the number of cases and drag it down a second time, and that'll make a duplicate of it here. And then we can play with the values. So to do that, you can either use the drop down arrow or uh, click over here, or you can also come over here and left click and come down to value field setting. And that'll get you both to the same place. And that's this lovely place here where we had the number formatting earlier. Um, and then we'll come over here to show values as, and this is where we get to play a little bit more with the numbers and they can do calculations. So we're looking at percentage of the grand total. And we can also change our column name so it makes a little more sense. So we can say um, case percentage, not the most enlightened title, but we'll go with it. And there we go. We can see how everybody really stacks up in percentage of the total grand total value of number of cases that we have here. Um, we can also look at maybe the percentage of the cost that they brought in, how much uh, you know, revenue they, they brought in, the total cost of the order. So we can bring the cost of items down here. And as much as I like the numbers, I'm not too worried about that. I just wanna see the percentages is, is what I'm gonna work with. So 
we can come over here and do value field settings. And we can then again use the percentage of the grand total here and hit OK. And now we've got two different sets of percentages. And what I like to look at is which one of these is really the best metric for who is doing the best for the company's bottom line. So while the percentage of cases is great and we can see that, you know, um, Sam's doing great in both cases here, there's some differences in the total of profit that's being brought in. Um, we can see that there's some differences in the percentages that change things up a little bit. So maybe if we're wanting to see who's really doing best for the bottom line for the company, we'd rather look at the percentages of the cost of items. So we've got some other options we can play with as well. We could look at the difference related to the top seller. So let's uh, get rid of our, clear out all of our stuff here and bring out, and we'll look at the percentage case-wise just because it's a nice simple one that doesn't involve too much reformatting. And we wanna see our top seller here is Sam and we wanna see how everybody stacks up to Sam. So we can bring up our second one down here and again, go back to value field settings. And we can look at the calculations and scroll down to percent difference from. And we can compare to one of the people in our list. And so we're looking for Sam Nguyen here. And we're gonna compare everybody to Sam. And we'll do, um, call this competitive percentage. Very long name for a very small column. So we can see how people are stacking up in relation to Sam. Now this might be something where you're having to decide to let somebody go and you really need to look at, you know, who's just not pulling their weight. And you can see, you know, Meg Benson here, unfortunately she is 50.98% below Sam. And that's pretty, that's a pretty big number, but you know, Scott's got 58.98, so he's really not doing good. And so you can look at who's doing the, the percentages and who's doing not so good. You could also look at it, there was the option for uh, just looking at the differences without having percentage. Um, you could look at, the differences of just the, the total number of cases and see what the differences are there as well if you wanted to keep it a little more simple. Just depends on how you're wanting to work with those numbers. Uh, once you add other factors in there like uh, adding um, dates to the rows or products to the columns, it can, you can really tinker with the numbers uh, and get creative with that. All right, any questions about the values there? Not the values, uh, but does making uh, it into a table format help with issues in searching, say an employee number that may not have uh, leading zeros? Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that one. I'd have to tinker with that and look at it. Um, that one, I'm not sure off the top of my head. We'll put a pin in that and see if we can, maybe if we have time at the end, tinker with that. Because um, I don't know right off the top of my head on that. Uh, but yeah, I'll, like I said, we'll, we'll see if we've got some time at the end to look at that. Though we're, we're quickly running out of time. So we'll, we'll have to work our way a little faster here. Um, so let's bounce quickly back to uh, uh, grouping, sorry. Our first and most easiest to group by is uh, dates. And a lot of times you'll want to do date grouping. So something I have noticed with 
2016 version of Excel is they have made it a little easier to work with. Um, typically, if you in the older versions, if you drop date down here, you just get the very, very long list of dates that just goes on and on and on and on and on forever. Um, with the newer versions of Excel, I have seen that if you bring date down, it will actually auto group for you and automatically break it up into years, quarters, and what was dates becomes, let me pull it up here so you can see it, months. Um, and that's just auto grouping that it does on 2016. But it doesn't do it all the time. Sometimes if you've already been working with the data, it won't group it like that. It'll just give you the straight dates. So let's say that that's what you're still working with. You've just got the dates here. How do we group it so that it's easier to work with and we get those years and months or whatever we'd like to work with? We can come over here and click on any given date and you wanna right click it and come to group. And this is where you get to see all the different options you have for grouping. Um, and so it lets us know our starting and ending ranges. And we wanna do, let's say we wanna go ahead and pull up what it automatically did for us. Uh, you can click multiple ones and it highlights them. If you didn't want months, you just click on it again and it would go away. And then you hit okay and it breaks it up for us. Now it automatically breaks it up into descending order of size that you're working with. So years are obviously the biggest block of time and then quarter and then individual month. Um, but it's, it's a nice thing to be able to, to see the numbers broken out and say we wanted to look at the totals as well. We could come back to our design section here and bring up our subtotals. And we can either have them at the bottom or we are currently in which format? We are currently, I believe, in tabular, which automatically puts the numbers at the bottom. Outline would bring it, let us bring it up at the top or put it at the bottom, whichever you'd like to do there. I am a fan of the tabular format just because I like having those lines there without having to have the, the colors and it's easier for me to work with, but everybody has their own preferences. Um, so something that we can do, say we wanted to compare the months for each individual year side by side, we can take our quarters and get rid of that and we can actually take the years and dates and flip them. And date isn't the most accurate. So we can actually change that to reflect months since that's what we're wanting to look at. You can just click on it and type in what you want it to say. So month, there we go. That makes a lot more sense. And there we go. We can see how we did in 2019 versus 2020. And in this comparison, we don't really care about subtotals, so we can just get rid of those. And we'll be able to see the comparisons for our months side by side. And be like, oh, look, we did really great in 2019. But for some reason in this region, we didn't do quite as well in this current year. Um, so that's a, a nice way to be able to break that up there. If you did just have the months, something to keep in mind is that would put the total of both months together. So you have both January 2019 and 2020 in the same cell there. So maybe that's what you want, maybe that's the information you need, but if not, that kind of muddies the water a little. So some other options for grouping that we have. Um, and you can use the option of collapsing your filter, or sorry, collapsing your rows, or you can use filters to, to narrow your information down. So let me bring back years and quarters. So if you were wanting to only look at uh, your quarter numbers, you can 
use that to narrow things down and it'll show you just the quarters or you can pull the months out and just look at the quarters there. And then if you wanted to see all of the months broken up individually or a few specific months, you can use the filter option here to bring up a filter that would let you pull up the months individually. So there is options for how you expand or compact your information. And we'll get a little more into filters in a bit when we get into slicers. So we'll work our way over there, hopefully a little more quickly because time is short. Um, so we'll look at other ways of grouping. So you don't have to group just with dates. Uh, dates tend to work the easiest because they have a lot of options to work with there. Um, but you can group like areas. Let's say we wanted to work with this table here and we wanted to look at the numbers for the entire east region and the entire west region. We didn't want it broken up into four quadrants, just two. Um, so first we'd need to get our southeast next to our northeast. And fortunately with pivot tables, that's really easy to do. You can just click and drag and it moves the whole thing over and just switches them up. Very easy to do like that. And then you highlight the two that you're wanting to group together and right click and group. And obviously group one is not a very informative name so we can change this to east. And we've got our east information and then we can collapse it down and there we've got all of our east totals up together. And then we can do the same over here for the west. So again, highlight what you're wanting to group together, click group and rename it to west. And now we can see just the information for east and west and region two isn't particularly informative. So we could change that to, mm, East, West sales so that we can see what we're working with. So that is another way to group. I'm gonna undo that so that we don't tinker with our other sections. And then we can also group on um, the rows. So let's say we wanted to group all of our pies together. Uh, so that we could see what our sales for pies in general were. So we can click on moon pie and down to panda pies and group those just like we did with the regions. And we could label that pies. And we could do the same with our cookies and cakes and rolls if we had additional ones of those. But in our example here, we've only got one of each of those, but you could, in theory, label this cakes, cookies, and rolls. And then if you ever added products where you had multiple rolls, then you'd be able to have little groups that you could expand and shrink. And then you could look at just the totals for those groupings. Any questions about grouping? I know I went through that pretty quickly, but we are running out of time and I didn't want to leave slicers out because they are very handy. Um, we do have a couple of questions, um, uh, maybe not about the grouping. Uh, what is the difference between uh, standov, stem develop, var and verp? Those would be advanced questions. So if uh, you're interested in that um, and want to know a little bit more, we can look into having an advanced class maybe, or uh, we do have book a librarian options and we can see if we can get a librarian uh, hooked up with you who can go over those different items or give you resources that can help explain those. But that is unfortunately outside of our scope for this class. Um, I do see that somebody was wanting to know how, to, uh, how I got the year and uh, months up there. So I can show that again real quickly. Um, that was part of our date grouping back here. So like I said, with, uh, with the 
let me see if I can back it up because one thing you'll notice is uh, as you get more uh, fields that are generated, you will see that they pop up in the listing here of fields. So let me back this one up so that we get rid of our product two listings because we don't want that dancing around with us. Okay. Back, 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 back. There we go. Okay. So um, as I was saying, um, 2016 Excel typically will break up the, the uh, date into quarters, years, and months when you put it into rows. It doesn't always do that. And if for some reason it doesn't do that, um, you can easily get it to break it up by using the, the grouping options. So let me just bring years down here. Um, so you can come back here to right click and get group. And then you can get rid of or add whatever you want. Another option um, I did mean to mention but got sidetracked on is you can, let's say you're looking at pay periods for people. Um, you can actually do that with days. And let's say you've got a two week pay period that you're working on. You can do 14 days. And then you always wanna make sure that uh, you have the start date of your pay period. So let's say this is one starts at the very beginning of the year. Um, and the year 2019 started on a Tuesday, I believe. So we'll do the day before just to keep everything nice and even. So 12, 31, 18. And hit OK. And actually have to have something in that section that does help out. There we go. And so you can see we've got uh, our 14 day groupings that you can see here. And you could use this for like if you wanted to show how much a person earned in each pay period, or if you were looking at actual income for those periods, or whatever you'd like. Um, you can change the groupings depending on what's relevant to what you're working with. Um, so that's something that I meant to mention, but we got sidetracked on and it's okay. All right, any other questions? If you do, if you can do a quick demonstration of uh, putting a pivot table on the same worksheet. Um, sure. We have a yeah. question. If you have a, a, a create a different pivot table on a different worksheet, but later need to include it on the original worksheet, how do you do that? Um, well, I believe, and um, it's been a while since I've tried this, I believe you, if you wanted to, like if you had everything set up exactly how you wanted it and you wanted to bring it over exactly as it was, I think you could just copy and paste it. Um, let's find out, shall we? Um, say this is exactly how we want it to be. I believe we can just copy and paste, but let's find out. It's been a long time since I've moved something that's already been created. Yeah, okay, so you can just copy and paste it if you have it exactly as you want it. If you were wanting to start from scratch, you could just uh, create a new one. So let's see, Control Z, I want you to go away, be gone. There we go. So if you wanted to just start from scratch, you could just create a new pivot table and um, come back up to insert and just pick your existing worksheet and where you'd like to set it. So let's say right there, hit okay. And you can put anything you'd like in there to your heart to content. Um, so I think that covers that. All right, and since we've got five minutes left, we're gonna run through slicers real quick. And then if we've got any time at the end, which I kind of feeling we're not, uh, we can answer anything else. <laughs> it is a lot to cover with pivot tables, that's for sure. Um, so slicers are basically a more visual way to do uh, filtering. So it does the same things that you get from the drop down here, but instead of having to do multiple clicks to get to what you want. So let's say we just wanted to see Happy Mart and Snack Shack. You know, that, that took a few clicks to get there. I mean, it's not the worst, but it is a few more steps than you'd possibly want to do. Um, and you can clear your filters here with this button. We can instead come up to the pivot tables ribbons and hit the analyze one and insert a slicer. And this one gives us options from the different fields that we can slice. 
and let's say we're wanting to slice something that's already there. Uh, so let's say customers like we were just looking at. Hit OK. And now we have a little list of all of our customers and we can adjust the size of it so it doesn't take up too much space. But we don't want to be able to scroll. There we go. And this, you just click on what you'd like to see and it will show you. If you want to have multiple selections, you can hit multi-select up here and it'll let you select multiple ones. And then again, you can clear using the clear filter option. And that's just a more visual way to do your filtering and it's just a little faster. Um, you can also filter based off of stuff that isn't present in the table. So if you're done with that filter, you can hit the delete button and it goes away. You can create a new slicer and say we wanted to uh, change things by the date. That's not something that's currently on the table visually, but we can do that. And we've got our long list of dates that we've got here. And we, since we previously had the dates broken up into three uh, two week periods, it will show us those two week periods. We can multi select. If we wanted to have more options date wise, we can clear this out and get rid of that and bring back our other date options that we had. Um, so to do that, we'd have to change our groupings here. So since we had it grouped that way, we'd rather have, let's say, something a little more relevant. So look at maybe months, quarters. So we've got those available, but we don't want it broken up here so that it's a big, long series of stuff. We can get rid of those and it stays in our selection of fields. And so we still got our nice compact table. Go back to analyze and the slicer. And now we have the option of breaking it up by quarters or by a date, which has now been changed to month. So we have our options for our months here and we can see those. And we can also, change uh, how the slicer is set up. Uh, you can change what order they're put in, the name of the different things. And I believe there's a way to put it into columns, but it's been a while since I've done that. Let's see. I'll have to look up how to do that one. That was a little bit more advanced, but you can click on individual months and see. So for the month of January, We've got these numbers here. You can also do that with the quarters. If you wanted to look at the dates broken up into, let's say, months, quarters, and years, we could do that as well. So we can bring back our slicing tools here and insert and have quarters. Okay. So now we've got two slicers. And something to note is when you select something in one slicer, it does affect the other slicers. So, so we narrowed it down to quarter one, which is only these three months. All of the other ones have grayed out. So it gives you a little bit of a power to adjust things a little bit. So let's say we decided we don't want it to look at the third quarter, but oh, hey, we need to narrow it down to specific months in that quarter. And you can do it that way. There's a lot of flexibility with the slicers and you can have as many as you can fit into your uh, window space that you're working with. So you can pick and choose what's best for displaying the information that you need. Another option when it comes to timelines or to dates and time to be more specific is the timeline feature. Um, so let me show that real quick as the last bit of what we're doing. Uh, the neat thing about the timeline is that um, it visually is, is fun to work with. The downside to it, though, is it is limited. It can't do uh, non-consecutive dates. So like if you were looking at May through September, you can look at a consecutive set of time. But if you wanted to look at both April combined with April from the next year, or you wanted to look at June 
or every other month, you couldn't do that. It doesn't give you that option, unfortunately. But the timeline does have a way to break up your days, quarters, and years here without having to get into the groupings like you do with the slicer. So that's a neat little feature there. And unfortunately, we are entirely out of time. Uh, that hour went by very quickly and we did cover quite a lot. Um, there is a tab for pivot charts. Uh, we had the hope of if we got to the pivot, uh, got through the pivot table information, we could get into charts. But unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, so if you are interested in looking into the pivot charts, we can definitely look at that as an advanced class for later in the year, uh, the new year, since we are at the end of this year. <laughs> So thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you have any questions uh, about navigating Excel, again, we do have the option of book a librarian, which is a 30 minute one-on-one -on -one session. And uh, we can definitely have people, um, librarians connect with you to go over sets of information or provide resources that'll explain that. Uh, there's also lynda.com, which is a free resource with your library card. Do check that out. It has many classes that do great uh, tutorial, video tutorial walkthroughs, and they have downloadable exercise files that you can work with um, that will let you follow along just like you did with this class. So I highly recommend that for uh, advanced topics for sure. All right. Thank you, everybody, for attending. <laughs>